of reactions, um, specifically talking about energy and how energy changing hands is effect is a product of or one of the driving forces behind um, chemical reactions. And then we'll start being able to do things like do stoichiometry, but with energy, instead of just talking about products and reactants, we'll start talking about how much energy can be released um, as a result of a chemical process. Um, and so today we'll, we'll start talking about energy and how temperature change of the surroundings of, um, is uh, winds up being one of the most important ways we can measure the specific processes that are happening. Um, wrong, but sorry. So who's had physics in here? Anybody had some physics or at least do you talk about kinetic energy versus potential energy in your in your freshman science class or anything like that? So turns out energy. Hi. Uh, is Marta here? Oh, sorry. Um, kinetic energy is the way we define it is it's the energy of things that are in motion relative to something else. So when when two things. When something is moving, we say it has kinetic energy. When something um, could start moving, we kind of we refer to that as potential energy. It could be turned into kinetic energy, but it's not kinetic energy yet. It's not movement yet. So in, in macroscopic terms, uh, a kinetic energy might be a bowling ball rolling down a hill. The bowling ball has kinetic energy. And it has potential energy because as long as it's above the, the ground, the flat part of the ground, this, this height and the, and the acceleration due to gravity mean that it's going to continue to gain kinetic energy until it reaches that flat spot, right? Is that all sounding familiar, at least conceptually? Can, and chemicals, kinetic energy is actually measured in terms of temperature, kinetic energy is basically the motion of the individual molecules and atoms. So same basic principle, except we're dealing with, instead of something like a bowling ball, we're dealing with something that's too small to measure directly, something really, really tiny. And so we don't actually have a way to measure kinetic energy directly. In, in terms of macroscopic objects, um, how would we measure the kinetic energy of say a, a bowling ball that's rolling. Speed, right? We look at how fast it's going in that speed. And we look at, take that speed as the original equation is kinetic energy of an object is equal to one half the mass of that object times the velocity of that object squared. Um, and that gives us that gives us a unit. If we put all of these terms in, in um, units of um, if we put all of these variables in SI units, so that would be kilograms per mass and then meters per second, and we're going to square that, we get it, we get units that don't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, but a kilogram meters squared per second squared is basically been redefined as a joule. A joule is an is a unit of energy. Joule spelled J O U L E. Like most of our units, it's named after a person. Um, although that's one of the ones where I don't actually know specifically anything about joule um, as a person, but I know it was a person. Um, and so that's that's going to be our standard unit of energy for the most part, is we're going to be dealing with joules of energy. And it still applies when we're talking about tiny, tiny objects, right? We're talking about an individual molecule. The mass is different. The velocity is still just velocity, right? Um, the difference, though, is that when we're dealing with individual molecules, we tend to be dealing with them for uh, looking at an entire mole of of molecules at once. So a lot of times in chemistry, we'll be dealing with kilojoules per mole. 
which is, but it still comes back to the same thing. If we took an entire mole of those, of that compound, and we looked at um, the mass of that object and this, and the velocity of those um, atoms and molecules, we still would wind up with an energy unit. It still comes from the same root. Potential energy is a little bit trickier to think about, but luckily, because we've talked about orbitals so extensively, um, we actually have all the right tools and the right, right way to talk about potential energy in terms of chemicals. Um, the most basic way to think about it is, is potential energy is the energy that's stored in the bonds. Um, so if you remember talking about That was pretty bad. You might remember looking at this graph where we had energy and we had um, distance between two atoms. There was a certain, as we got this, the um, atoms closer and closer together, there was this minimum right here, right? That was the lowest potential energy or the lowest energy state we could have for those two atoms. And it was at a certain distance between the two atoms, right? Well, it turns out not all chemical bonds have the same, they all have a similar shape to this, to this um, function, but the actual height of different bonds is gonna be a little bit different. And so the potential energy that we could release is, okay, if, if this was say um, the shape of a hydrogen bond to another hydrogen bond, well, a hydrogen bond to an oxygen bond might look something more like this, where you actually have a lower energy state that you could get to. If, if those are, that's our hydrogen hydrogen bond, if we had a way to kind of bump those over into the lower energy state, that actually becomes more stable. And since the universe in general moves towards increasing stability, making things more stable or lower energy is just sort of kind of a property of how the universe works. Um, the difference in energy here, that's potential energy. And when we move from a high energy bond to a lower energy bond, that energy is released as kinetic energy. In other words, heat. So we actually see how the same principles of energy still apply as when we're talking about macroscopic objects. We just have to think about them a little differently because we're thinking about them in terms of energy levels and molecules moving around instead of um, those larger macroscopic way to think of it just in terms of just gravity pulling something down. Um, we're not going to do a whole lot in this class in terms of calculating work. Uh, there, there's an entire class in upper division chemistry called uh, physical chemistry that looks at applying more specifically applying um, physics concepts like work to chemical systems. Um, so if you if you are going to go into more of a physics or chemistry field, you will take that class at some point. And you'll actually learn how you can turn things like chemical bonds into work, which is just the ability to, to um, change something's velocity, um, which the most, the most obvious connection is um, where we see that all the time is uh, internal combustion engines. Internal combustion engines work by doing a process like this, take high energy bonds and turn them into lower energy bonds, which creates a lot of heat in the system. If you let that that heat um, warm up the gas molecules, the gas molecules start moving faster and you can use that to actually expand a cylinder. When that cylinder expands, if it's attached to a drive shaft, you wind up with the ability to create motion. Um, but that, like I said, there's an entire class on that um, where you learn about things, that, that process is called the Carnot cycle. Um, and if you, if you have taken the multivariable calc, and then you can start applying multivariable calc concepts to 
to that process and you can wind up taking partial derivatives of the change in pressure with respect to the change in temperature at a constant volume and things like that. Um, really interesting math problems, but uh, I'm not, I don't know it well enough to teach it off the top of my head and y'all don't have the math yet anyway, I don't think. Anybody in, in Cal 3 yet? Yeah, good. Then I can just continue hand waving and not be called out when I have to make broad sweeping statements like that. Um, so let's talk about some other energy units because there are actually, just like with length and, and time, there are lots of different energy units. And the most appropriate energy unit is going to depend a little bit on what context we're in. Um, a joule is actually not the first energy unit that was defined that was used in chemistry. That's a calorie. So a calorie, just like a nutritional calorie, um, it has a definition. It's Calorie is actually specifically tied to water. Calorie is the amount of energy that's required to raise the temperature of, of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, which isn't very much, right? Think about what, it, what does a gram of water look like? One milliliter, right? It's tiny. One milliliter of water, one degree Celsius. That's really not very much energy. Um, in fact, it's such a small amount of energy. That's not actually the nutritional calorie in the US is actually not quite the same. Um, a nutritional calorie in the US is a kilocalorie. Um, however, we don't see it labeled as kilocalorie that often, at least again, not in the US because um, people in the US get really scared when they see metric you know, prefixes, kilo is scary. Um, and so what they do instead, they still label it properly, but they just redefine it to be a capital C calorie. Capital C calorie is the same as a, ki as a kilocalorie. And so that's actually enough energy to warm a thousand grams of water by one degree Celsius. Um, and if you look on your nutritional facts, if they're written properly, I think recently I've seen somewhere they've gotten lazy with this, it sh calories should be listed with a capital C. Um, and if you go to other parts of the world that aren't as scared of the metric system, you'll see they actually labeled as kcals. Um, I think, if you get a, uh, a bottle of Coca-Cola from that's made in Mexico, I think it says kilocalorie on it, it says KCAL on there. Um, but it's really the same calories as, as in the US, just we don't put the prefix in front of it. Um, in other disciplines, there's some really interesting energy um, units. Has anybody ever heard of a BTU? If you've ever done any work on it on a furnace or if your family's ever had to put in a new water heater into your house, anything like that, um, water heaters and furnaces tend to be rated in terms of BTUs, which is essentially how much energy can it put out per, um, probably per hour, I think. Um, but basically, it stands for British Thermal Unit is what BTU stands for. It doesn't, you know, it's basically because calories would be too small. If we're dealing with calories you want, if you're talking about a hot water heater or a furnace, you want something that's bigger unit. Um, electron volts or EV, lowercase e, uppercase V, is used in physics and in chemistry to some extent. Is basically um, kilojoules per mole. Let's just talk about an entire mole uh, reacting at a at time, EV is the unit you use if you're talking about a single atom reacting at once. So for whatever reason, it tends to be used more in physics. Uh, we don't use it very often because in chemistry, we're not ever dealing with just one atom at a time. Um, therms is an interesting one. Therms is 100 cubic feet of natural gas. Um, so if you take natural gas and you burn it like in a, in a stove, or something like that, the amount of energy you get out of burning 100 cubic feet of natural gas at some arbitrary pressure um, is known as a therm of energy. Kilowatt hours shows up on, on utility bills. Um, barrel of oil equivalents, or BOE, is literally the amount of energy that you get if you took an, a barrel of crude oil and turned it into gasoline how much energy does that result in? So it's basically, it's a way of, of tying in shipping and transportation um, to energy units, but it actually has a conversion. There's a conversion for barrel of oil equivalent to kilojoules. 
which is weird um, because those fields are pretty different from each other. And then one of my favorites is tons of TNT. Tons of TNT is a legit, um, is a real unit of energy. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a metric ton of, of TNT being detonated all at once that has a certain amount of energy associated with it. We only really use that when we're talking about giant explosions, right? But in theory, there, and not in theory, there is a conversion for tons of TNT to kilojoules per mole. Um, does anybody know who invented TNT? Not invented, but first found a way to stabilize it. Yeah, Alfred Nobel. Um, and really, he didn't. He was one of the first people to synthesize TNT, and he did it in a way where he was able to turn it into dynamite. He was really the one who was able. It, this is the chemical engineering aspect. He was able to take TNT and then process it in a way. Basically, what he did is he soaked it sawdust in TNT, in liquid TNT, and then packaged the sawdust in paper and to make tubes. And that's what a stick of dynamite was originally. It was literally just sawdust soaked in TNT. Um, and yeah, he, there was a, there's an interesting story about there was, yeah, go ahead. No. So TNT, um, that is another form of it. TNT is this compound, uh, you got an NO2 group. It stands for trinitrotoluene. <laughs> Toluene is a benzene ring with a, with a carbon attached to it. If you put three nitro groups around it, it gets really, really unstable. So trinitrotoluene is this compound, which is a liquid at room temperature. Um, if you soak something in it, then you get something like that. So I don't actually think, and I have to double check this. I don't think TNT is actually in gunpowder, um, but it's thought of, it's similar because it's a similar time frame and got used for similar things, making stuff blow up as black powder. Um, but I don't think it's that there is any TNT in in black powder. It's saltpeter, and I'm not going to speculate off the top of my head because I'm not going to be able to come up with it. Um, but the, the interesting story about how, why Nobel Alfred Nobel went from making dynamite to founding the Nobel Peace Prize um, is because he um, there was an accident at one of his factories in Sweden, Sweden or Norway, Sweden, I think. Um, where his brother was killed. And in the, in the late 1800s, when this happened, there was a mix up on the telegram and all the newspapers in the English speaking world thought it was Alfred Nobel that died. And so they published the front page news and they published, a, I think it was the London Times published a, pay, a piece titled Merchant of Death Dies or something like that. And he heard about that and he's like, wow, they consider me the merchant of death. Um, I should probably do some good things before I actually die. And so he took all the money that he made from selling dynamite and um, founded the Nobel Peace Prize with it, um, which is just an, an interesting historical aside. Um, really fascinating guy for a lot of reasons. He also didn't think TNT was going to be that dangerous because it was just made to be used in mines. He thought it was actually a safer way to mine things. Um, but he failed to realize that as soon as you come up with any new technology, the first thing that governments do is turn it into a weapon. Um, and so he really, really was not a big fan of, of dynamite being used in military applications. But once the cat's out of the bag, you can't stop it, right? Um, this is a really interesting graph, too, because this is a logarithmic graph of just some putting jewels in terms of, of everyday events. Um, the amount of energy that you use to sleep one hour. So when you're sleeping, you're still burning calories, right? Smaller number than when you're awake. Um, but you wind up with using about 10 to the fifth or which is what about 100. Is that 100,000? Yeah. 100,000 joules of energy just to sleep for an hour. Um, riding a bike for an hour is about a million joules or a thousand kilojoules, right? Um, that's also, interestingly enough, would be one serving of carbohydrates of donuts or um, pasta. That's about the same amount of energy that, it, that, you, that you spend by riding a bicycle for an hour. 
a um, hundred times greater than that is the energy from one gallon of gasoline. So one serving of pasta has a million joules in it. One gallon of gasoline has 10 million. No, sorry. At 100, 100 million joules of energy. Um, you look at, and, and this is back, this is a 10 year old figure at this point. I shall get an updated one, but I haven't seen a good one recently. Um, energy used per person in the US in one year is 10 to the 11 joules. So what's that? 100 billion? 100 billion joules. Look at the difference there. 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 17. 10 to the 17 joules of energy reach the earth from the sun every second. So that's a million times more energy reaches earth from the sun in one second than someone in the US uses in an entire year, which is a little bit wild to think about, right? That's a kind of a big difference. Um, if we were able to take all of that solar energy in for one second of solar energy would be enough for a million people in the US for an entire year. There's a lot of practical um, reasons why we can't do that. One, we don't you know, own or control all of the entire surface of the earth at any given time. Um, so you know, nobody could actually get that. And two, there's actually a hard limit mathematically on how much energy you can take from the sun and turn it, if you're trying to turn it into electrical energy, you can only get about 33%. Um, of the energy can be turned into electrical energy based on the way semiconductors work. I'm glad you asked because it's a it's something I don't need to go into a tangent about, but you all have the right um, the ability to understand this. The way semiconductors work is when you shine light on them, you take electrons from the from the highest occupied level and you move them up to, to the lowest unoccupied level. This all looks familiar, right? That's, that's absorbing light. If it falls right back down, it gives off that light, right? All a photovoltaic is, a solar cell is, is it's a way that this orbital is tied into a circuit. So your electrons move through a circuit before they're allowed to fall back down. And in this circuit, there's a, we can wire it up a lot of different ways, but if this is a, a way to charge a battery, you basically have a way to generate electrical energy just by letting the electron fall back down the way it normally would. Basically, this is an, a quantum scale version of just using a, ste a steam turbine or a water wheel. Using a water wheel to generate electricity is the same idea, except using gravity and water moving downhill. This is using electrons moving downhill figuratively to generate current. Um, and the pro the reason that this, this has a hard limit um, is because not all of the photons from the sun are exactly the right wavelength of light to hit this and promote it just right. Some of them don't have enough energy. So all the photons that are too low energy, when they hit this system, will just pass right through it because nothing can absorb it. And anything that's higher energy when it hits this, is going to wind up with all of the X. So let's say we had a photon hit that had enough energy to move an electron all the way up to here. Well, the difference between these two winds up being wasted because we don't have a way to, to wire up every individual photon's wavelength to its own circuit. So this energy just winds up being lost. And anything that's too low in energy just passes right through the system. And so there's a there's a theoretical maximum. I think it's actually 34% called the quasar shocky limit. Uh, and I'm not going to try to spell Quasar's name because it's been too long since I took that class. But the quasar shocky limit is the is the theoretical maximum that you could get with what's called a single junction semiconductor. He's Q Q U I E S S E R maybe. Um, 
So, but even even if we take that limit into account, that's still a lot of solar energy reaching the Earth, right? Turns out the the limits, the hard limits on solar, are really more to do with practical issues, like. For instance, what do we do because we're not using all of that energy all at the same time, right? So where do you store all of that electrical energy? Well, you need batteries for that. And batteries aren't as, as efficient as a lot of other ways of, of using energy right away. Every time an energy changes hands, changes hands, anytime an energy goes from one form to another form, usually about 10% to 50% of that energy is just straight up lost as waste. And so going from solar energy to electrical energy to battery energy back to electrical energy, there's a lot of loss in that process. Every one of those steps is going to be at least a 10% loss in energy. Um, plus, we also just need a way to actually collect all of that. Getting all of those 10 to the 17 joules of energy per second would, would mean that we covered the entire surface of the Earth with solar cells. One, that's expensive to buy all those solar cells. And two, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for anything else to happen. Um, so there are, solar is still really promising just because of that sheer number, but getting it to where it could be a complete replacement for fossil fuels still has a lot of kinks to be worked out. Um, if you want, if you keep going here, energy consumption for one year in the US is 10 to the 20. So basically in a thousand seconds, if we got that, th that theoretical case where we could actually catch all of the energy, it would only take a thousand seconds to power the U.S. for an entire year. Um, and again, this number is probably not that different, but world reserves of fossil fuels is about a thousand times more than that. And then the last one that's really interesting is energy radiated by the sun per second. So not just what hits the earth, but the entire sun um, radiates 10 to the 23rd joule, 26 joules per second. That's even more, right? That's a billion times more energy than actually hits the earth. Where's the rest of that energy going? Into the rest of the universe, right? That's just this, the earth is one tiny little piece of the sur what surrounds the sun, right? So the rest of that energy is going to hit other planets, is going to continue off into other solar systems. Um, it's basically a waste in terms of we can't really use that energy unless does anybody other than, uh, other than in context of vacuums, has anybody ever heard the name Dyson? Dyson sphere, exactly. It's basically the idea that, well, if 10 to the 17 joules hits the earth per second and the other 10 to the 23rd joules, 26th joules are just wasted, what if we just took the sun and we, what if we just enclosed it in one big sphere and capture, then we could capture all of that light, right? And turn it all into energy that we could use or it turn the entire interior of this sphere into um, parts of it into farmable land basically would eliminate land scarcity um, on the inside of this giant sphere which is it's an interesting sci-fi concept and it's been it's been theorized by by biologists and by astronomers um, that if there was a society that was capable of, of um, continuing to develop intelligent life. Basically every society in, will eventually wind up making some form of this because otherwise it's just inefficient, right? If it's, a, if it's a species that's smart enough to understand how light works and grow and become spacefaring, then they're also smart enough to realize this is a lot more efficient. And so that's actually one of the ways that the SETI project looks for signs of intelligent life is they look for things that, that would look like what a Dyson sphere would look like. So basically things that radiate heat, but no visible light.
and there's a lot of engineering aspects to that too, right? There's like, where do you get enough mass to do this? This would take almost as mass enough mass as an entire sun itself to be able to do that. And that's assuming it was the right element to be able to create something like that. Um, if this, uh, the book's a little bit dated, but there was a book by a guy named Larry Niven um, called Ring World, which he basically said, okay, well, if a Dyson sphere is impractical because it's too big and how do you support it? How do you keep it from collapsing on itself and things like that? Well, what if you just took, instead of making an entire sphere, what if you just took a, like a 10 mile wide strip and turned it into a ring around a sun? So very similar to the video game Halo, right? So this was back in the seventies. Um, basically that would still be, it would only take as much mass as an entire gas giant instead of an entire sun. Um, which is a lot more feasible, still way beyond anything humanity could do. Um, but then you would also have something like it would be about the same area as about a thousand Earths. So you would have still have a ton of land and lots of um, lots of space for for farming and activities and photovoltaics and things like that. So it's always fun. This is one of the reasons I like this figure is because it does like, wow, these are some really big numbers we're dealing with. What can we actually do with that? Logan? So in, in um, Ringworld, it was, uh, he went through all the math at the beginning to explain his, his um, assumptions. And I believe he was saying that the radius of the, of the ring was, the, was one astronomical unit, the distance from the sun to the earth. So it's basically like, instead of the earth orbiting, replace the earth's orbit with a giant ring instead of one tiny ball that goes all the way around. And that one's, his, that book's old enough. You can almost always find it. I think I found, I've found several copies of that book at the used bookshop in town by, by Freshies. Um, they actually have a pretty decent youth. Um, classic sci-fi section that you can usually find something by Larry Niven there. All right, so how do we actually measure any of this in terms of uh, chemistry? Getting back to more applicable things. Um, basically, where everything is going to come back to this equation right here. Anytime we have something changing temperature, it's going to come back to this equation right here. This Q equals MCP delta T. I'll explain what each of those terms are, what they mean. Um, so delta T is the easiest one right off the bat, right? Because we know how to use delta. What is capital T? Temperature. So this is all this is is just change in temperature. This is mass. Um, the units are usually going to be in grams, um, but that depends a little bit on this term, which is specific heat. And specific heat is basically how many joules do you need to dump into a substance to get it to change temperature? And so different substance, different materials are gonna have different specific heats. What is changing temperature matters as much as what, or what the change in temperature itself is, right? So specific, if you look at the units, it's, um, in specific heat, it's generally going to be either joules per gram degree Celsius or calories per gram degree Celsius. And what that unit actually means, it's a weird combined unit, but it means, okay, this is the number of joules that it takes to change one gram, one degree Celsius. Joules per gram per degree Celsius. Right, so it's weird to have per in there twice, but it kind of makes sense when you think back to that definition of a calorie, right? A calorie was the amount of energy that it took to change one gram of water, one degree Celsius. The specific heat 
is the amount of energy it takes to change any substance, one gram, and uh, one gram of any substance, one degree Celsius. <clears throat> Um, and so the, the specific heat will tell you what the units for the rest of the equation need to be. Um, but almost always they're going to be, in for this class at least, they're going to be degrees Celsius, and we're going to be doing our masses in grams here. But you can look up specific heats in calories um, or in per degree Fahrenheit or in, you could find one that was calories per pound per degree Fahrenheit. Um, that's if you looked something, looked it up on Wikipedia or on a data data table or something like that. Um, it just has to be an energy over a mass over a temperature unit. Um, and then the last term here is this Q. Q is heat. And heat in scientific terms is not the same way we use the word heat in uh, everyday life. Everyday usage of the word heat just means something is hot, right? Something has, we say something has a lot of heat. That's not what it means in the sciences. Heat specifically means energy changing hands. So it's a change in energy by definition. All right, so. We, we're not going to, heat is not usually something that an object has. Heat is specifically talking about change, not a static system, um, which is tricky because we also have this term, right? Specific heat doesn't mean the same thing as just heat. It also doesn't mean the same thing as heat capacity. Those are three separate terms, and it gets really confusing because they all have the word heat in them, right? Heat is the change in energy, and the specific heat is, you can think of that as like the slope of the line. If you look at something like the temperature versus the amount of heat that you put in, if you put, if you started at, let's say we started right here at, I don't know, call it zero Celsius. When you put heat in, the temperature is going to go up, right? And it should be, if we're putting heat in at a constant rate, this should be a straight line, right? Makes sense? At least according to this equation, if you double Q, you'll double delta T, right? It's a linear proportional relationship. The mass and the specific heat are the slope. That's the slope of this line. Delta T is going to be the, the final minus initial. Q is the energy that you put in, right? And unfortunately, I don't have a good way to help you keep these straight, the difference between heat and specific heat, other than practice. And I'm just gonna to try to be as consistent as I can with my language, and I'm going to be really um, pedantic and correct you. If you, you say specific heat and you mean heat or vice versa, I'm gonna do my best to catch that as much as I can and correct you. Um, I'm not just trying to be a pain in the ass. It's just I'm trying to make sure that you know the difference between these two terms since they're so close. Unfortunately, that tendency to um, overcorrect tiny misusage of languages carries over into my everyday life. So my wife and my kids get driven nuts by that habit, um, but it will serve you as my students well. So is there anything tricky about this equation now that we know the terms? We, um, if we have a mass and we have a say a change in temperature, if we have a heat, is there any this it's just an algebra equation, right? Nothing really that tricky about it. So here's a here's an example problem. Uh, burning one gram of table sugar produces 16.5 kilojoules of energy. If all of the energy goes into 120 grams of water, what is the temperature change of the water? How could we figure that out? What do we need to know? Or what do we know?
We know specific heat. What is specific heat? Well, there's one given to us. Specific heat of liquid water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. That will, that's always the same. Water will always have the same specific heat as long as it's liquid water. Turns out ice has its own specific heat, but we'll get into that in a minute. So that's a constant. That makes that like that easier. What else do we know from this equation? What are we trying to find? Yeah, delta T. We're trying to find delta T. So what else? So we need to know three of the four pieces here, right? We know what Q is because it's given to us. It says 16.5 kilojoules. It's got energy units, even though it doesn't specifically say Q equals 16.5. The fact that it's in kilojoules is a pretty good indication that that's a heat. And then what about mass? That one's a little tricky. Why? Because there's two masses. So which mass do we are we actually going to plug in here? One gram or 120 grams? Why? Because the water is what's changing temperature. The problem says, what's the temperature change of the water? which means all of the rest of these variables have to be related to the water. We're not talking about temperature change of the sugar. If we did, we'd need specific heat of the sugar. But the fact that we're talking about temperature change of the water tells us we need to know mass of the water. So what do we get for delta T when we plug all this in? do the, this is one where you might want to do the algebra before you plug in numbers, which doesn't really matter that much. We're just solving for delta T, right? So Q over M C P. Is there anything else we need to do before we just plug stuff in? It's not a tricky step, but we got to convert. If this is in joules and this is in kilojoules, we either need to convert one of them one way or the other. Usually the, it's easiest to convert your energy into joules. So that's just gonna be times a thousand, right? So 16 and a half thousand joules. And then mass is 120 and specific heat. 4.184 joules gram degree Celsius. So joules will cancel joules, grams will cancel grams. We're gonna, our units work out, we'll get one over one over Celsius, right? And should wind up with something like, uh, 30, 300. Ten to the four divided by a hundred is going to give me ten to the two divided by another four is going to get so we're going to should be in the thirty range ish, right? That's actually kind of impressive when you think about that numbers, right? A hundred, a hundred and twenty grams is probably half of this mug it filled with water. One gram of sugar is a pretty tiny amount. It's a lot of energy in sugar, it turns out. Um, this process where you just burn 
burn food and you watch the temperature change, if you measured the temperature change to get Q, that process has its own name called calorimetry. Um, and at its most basic, this is how they actually measure how many calories are in food. Take food and burn it and see how much energy comes out the other side. Because in general, if you're only putting things into your body that your body can digest, then that's a pretty good measure for what the same process that your body goes through when it digests something. It takes something like glucose and oxygen and turns it into CO2 and water, which incidentally is the exact same process that you get when you burn something. This doesn't take into account things like artificial sweeteners that our body might not fully be able to digest um, or cellulose even for that matter. Like you can burn grass, but your body can't get energy out of grass, right? Because it winds up, um, because cellulose is a polymer that our body can't digest. So even though we can burn it, we don't get that energy out in terms of uh, nutritional calories. Um, but you can take all the components of food and burn them all separately if you know that what your body is able to digest. Um, and so this still to this day, I believe, is still the standard for figuring out how much energy. Uh, if there's um, something your body can digest, you just burn it. So how many kilocalories are in one gram of sugar? How many kilojoules are in one gram of sugar? 16.5. If we want to convert that into kilocalories, you just need a conversion sheet. Luckily, energy units are on your conversion sheet. In fact, this is, a, this is an easy one. If you remember what specific heat of water is in terms of calories, because what was our original definition of a calorie? It's the energy to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius, right? So the specific heat of water in calories is one one calorie per gram per degree Celsius. So that actually is one way that you can remind yourself is this number is gonna keep showing up a lot, 4.184. We're gonna use the specific heat of water all the time when we're doing these problems. So 4.184 joules is equal to one calorie. And that's really all the conversion, that we, the only conversion we really need to get from kilojoules to kilocalories. How about uh, if we wanted to apply, if we're doing kilojoules to kilocalories, how does that apply to our prefixes here? Can we just use the same prefix? If it's 4.184 joules is one calorie, is it 4.184 kilojoules is one kilocalorie? Let's look mathematically. We have kilojoules. We start by saying, okay, one kilojoule is a thousand joules. And then we can say 4.184 joules is one calorie. And then we can go to kilocalories, right? One 10 to the three kilocals or calories is one kilocal. What happens with those prefixes? We wind up doing the same. We wind up doing the same conversion twice, but in opposite directions, right? We multiply by a thousand, and then we're going to divide by a thousand. So anytime we have the same same prefixes on both sides of a conversion, that means we can we can do that without actually doing that math. So we can say four point one eight four kilo, kilojoules. equals one kilocal.
Um, that's a, not a trick that winds up showing up that often, but there are a few places where that winds up being really useful. For instance, if we're doing we're doing things in moles per liter, that also applies to millimoles per milliliter. Um, so we'll see that a few different places where we can just put the same prefix on top and bottom of a conversion without without worrying about it too much. So we're just going to take that 16.5 kilojoules, divide by 4.184, and we'll get something around four kcals per gram, right? Any Anybody study any nutrition? Pay attention to your calories. You guys are all in high school, so you shouldn't be yet. Um, not something you should worry about yet, but um, I, for wrestling, we do have to pay attention that for our nutritional intake. Um, yeah, one gram of sugar of carbohydrate is about four calories. So it kind of matches a little bit um, if you have some context. All right. There are a couple other cool concepts that we're going to talk about. I don't know why those were in there twice. Um, the, one of the first places we get to start applying some of these concepts of energy are when we start talking about phase change. Phase change winds up being a really good model for studying energy because we all have experience with phase change, right? We all understand how freezing water works to some extent. And same for melting, melting ice or evaporation. Those are all processes we see on a daily basis. Um, Turns out there is energy associated with each of those, which kind of makes sense when you think about it, because take it going from a solid to a liquid at the same temperature, you have to put energy into that system to get it to change, right? Um, and so in general, gas molecules have the most energy, liquids have less energy than a gas, but more energy than solid. And solids have the least energy at any given, at a, any specific um, temperature. And so the energy required to go from one phase to another has its own energy. They call that the heat of fusion or heat of vaporization. Um, there's also one more term. We, we, we didn't talk about sublimation yet in this class, did we? Yeah. I'm not seeing any heads nodding, so that usually means... We haven't talked about that yet. Um, sublimation is when you is a phase change that you can have where you bypass liquid. If you go straight from a solid to a gas, lots of lots of solids can do this, and we actually can see that up here at altitude. Um, if you've ever seen the way ice sort of disappears without ever turning into a liquid first. Under certain conditions, that happens up here at altitude. Um, that process is sublimation, All right? So we, and this figure is a decent job of showing it. Um, I'm gonna show a different version. This has it with respect to energy on the y-axis here. So if solid is the lowest energy, you can take a solid and melt it turn it into a liquid and then the liquid you can vaporize it or evaporate it to turn it into a gas all standard use of the words right um freezing the other word we use for freezing is something solidified we typically for whatever reason probably just because we're used to thinking about water our most common um liquid that turns into a solid is water uh, but technically freezing applies to any liquid that then turns into a solid um, we don't think of butter freezing, but that's or bacon grease freezing, but that's what it is. We usually would just say it solidifies. Solidifies works the same way. Um, if that sounds better, feels better to you when you're um, thinking about these, but it's the same process. And going from a gas to a liquid, again, we usually think about it in terms of water, but any gas can do that and go through a condensation process. Um, these other two over here are the ones we, we haven't talked about yet. So solid straight to a gas is sublimation. That um, the verb is sublimating, or I've also heard it called subliming. Um, a solid that sublimes is going straight from a solid to a gas. Um, and then the opposite process is called deposition. When you go straight from a 
gas to a solid, you're depositing a solid from a gas. And so that process is called deposition. Um, can anybody think about deposition um, in a way that, uh, or an example of deposition in everyday life? With lawsuits. Yeah, it does share a word there. Um, I'm not sure what the etymology is, why, why it's a deposition in legal terms. Um, I was thinking more of the physical processes though. Uh, who here drives? So when you go out in, all winter, when you go out in the, to uh, start your car in the morning, what's on the windshield of your car? How did it get there? Some of, sometimes condensation and then it freezes, right? But you can usually tell the difference if that's the case. Because sometimes it doesn't condense first. Sometimes it's not like a sheet of ice. Frost is deposition. Frost happens because you actually go straight from the gas phase to the solid phase without hitting liquid in between. If something, if it's rain that then freezes overnight, that looks different in terms of the ice that you get in the morning, right? Um, because it's going through two different phases. It's also the same reason that snow looks different than hail. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you think about it in terms of phase change. Why should snow look different than, than hail? They're both ice that was formed in the upper atmosphere, right? The difference is that snowflakes are coming straight from water as a gas to water as a solid. But hail is rain, is water as a gas, turns into water as a liquid, with liquid that then freezes on its way down from the clouds. So we do see deposition and sublimation happening in everyday life. You just have to pay attention and look a little bit closer because we don't see them at, at um, surface level very often, unless you know what to look for. Um, and all of these processes have their own energy associated with them. If you take one gram of ice and you melt it, you have to put in 334 joules of energy for every gram of ice that you melt. Every one of these processes has its own energy. If ice going from a from going from solid ice to liquid means you have to put in 334 joules, what happens when you go from a liquid to a solid? When something freezes, you get to put energy in, or are you going to get it back out? Well, melting the solid takes you up in energy. So when it melts or when it freezes, it actually gives off energy to the surroundings, which seems backwards. When you form ice, it actually gives off energy to the surroundings. But in terms of melting, this kind of makes sense. It makes sense that you have to put energy in to get ice to melt. Otherwise, ice just stays as ice, right? Ice doesn't melt unless the surroundings warm up. So, and some of these other ones are even trickier to think about. Who here has heard of evaporative cooling? What is evaporative cooling in terms of living mammals? Sweating, we sweat because sweat evaporates off of your skin, but dogs do it with their tongue, right? When any, any animals that pant are evaporate, letting water evaporate off of their tongue, which cools down their tongue. Humans evolved the ability to sweat instead because it's more effective at cooling your body down. Um, and so you actually absorb energy, go, energy goes into the liquid to turn it into a gas. That's how evaporative cooling works. Um, interesting evolutionary biology note, the, the ability to sweat is actually one of the things that made humans apex predators in Africa, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, um, because the fact that humans can cool themselves down at a much better rate than, than any animals that have fur means that basically humanity is able to just run animals down to the point where they can't continue to run anymore and will just lay down and let the human walk up and 
you know, poke them with a sharp stick until they stop moving. Um, that's literally the earliest, the evidence shows the earliest forms of hunting were primarily just endurance races. Just chase the animal until it stops running. And humans being able to sweat was a big deal because they could keep running for an extended period of time when other animals couldn't. Anthropologists do debate that back and forth though, but I think that's the current thinking right now. All right, so let's run some numbers for this. If you take 15 grams of ice, and you add it to a glass of water, how much energy does it take to convert all of that ice to liquid water? Well, we don't have a specific heat. Does that matter? Is the ice changing temperature when it melts? Everybody's first thought is always yes. But does it? Yes, I got these a little bit out of order. When something goes through a phase change, it actually maintains the same temperature while it's going through that process. So to answer my own question from one slide ago, ice doesn't change temperature when it's melting. It changes temperature before it melts if it was colder than the freezing point, and it can change temperature after it melts. But while it's melting, it stays the same temperature, close to zero Celsius. Depends a little bit on the conditions and some other things going on. But it turns out any phase change is going to happen at a constant temperature, which is also why when you boil water, it's always the same temperature. No matter how high you turn up the burner, you can't make your water boil at a higher temperature, can you? It's almost kind of silly to think about, but at the same time, well, why not? Because you're turning, you're adding more energy in when you turn the burner up high, right? So why doesn't the water get hotter? When you go through a phase change, any extra energy that you're dumping in is going towards the phase change, not changing temperature. So water boiling water is really convenient way to cook because you always get the same temperature. It's great for giving directions because you don't have to get out a thermometer, right? You can just say boil the water and then you stick the ramen in it for three minutes. Right? It'd be a lot harder if it said, okay, get your water to 80 degrees Celsius and then add your ramen, because then you have to worry about keeping it the same temperature. You have to worry about getting it there in the first place and measuring it. Boiling is actually just a really convenient way to give directions. Um, and so when we go back one slide, so if there's no temperature change when the ice is melting, how do we figure out how much energy has to go into the ice to melt it? Well, we don't have a temp, we don't have a temperature unit. Our, this delta H value, delta H is basically you can think of it, the H kind of like heat. Um, it actually is for a it's a variable called enthalpy, which is a, effectively is the energy in the chemical bonds. So the enthalpy of Fusion of freezing. Fusion is the other word for solidifying or freezing. Um, enthalpy of fusion has units of joules per gram. That's a unit just like a density or a speed, right? That's a combined unit, which means that's really just a conversion, right? So if we said we have 15 grams of ice, Well, every one gram of ice means 334 joules, joules are absorbed. So phase changes, that's it's actually pretty easy. It's, it's a lot like doing stoichiometry 
where we can just say, okay, well, I have 15 grams, one gram of ice means 334 joules have to be absorbed. If you're melting one gram of ice, it's 334 joules. So for these phase change processes, it's that simple. You just need these delta H values for whatever we're dealing with. Is every substance gonna have the same delta H effusion? Is it going to take the same amount of energy for one gram of iron to melt as it takes for one gram of water? No. Just the same way every substance is going to have its own specific heat, every substance is going to have its own enthalpy of fusion or evaporation or condensation. Flip around this logic though, if we want to make 15 grams of ice from 15 grams of water, does the number change? You put in 334 joules to get to the liquid water. If we're going the other direction, it's the same distance, right? It's the same amount of energy, just in the opposite direction. So the only thing that would really change is if we were talking about forming ice, it would be joules of en energy released instead of absorbed. <laughs> the, if we're talking about turning liquid water into ice, we're going to release energy. If we're turning ice into water, we're going to absorb energy. And so you can think of that as sort of just like a plus and a minus. Although the, with, with energy and defining our system, that can get kind of confusing. Um, so I like to add the qualifier, just like we did with stoichiometry, where we said made, or we say produced, or we would say used. Same with energy, it's either absorbed or released. The way you keep track of your sign is just by paying attention to um, what is the reaction that's happening. Are we producing heat as a product, in which case it's being released, or are we absorbing heat as a reactant? The other aspect of that, that also means we don't actually need two different values. The delta H of, of fusion is 34, 334 joules per gram absorbed, or sorry, it's fusion, we're talking about solidifying, freezing. So that would be released. But delta H of you don't even usually write it this way. Delta H of melting would just be the opposite sign. It'd be 334 joules per gram absorbed. Same number opposite sign. All right, let's finish this problem here. So we had 334 joules per gram, 15 grams, 15.0 grams. trying to use kilojoules here, 334 joules. And we're talking about melting, so it's absorbed. 15 times 334 gets something like 4,800. Five thousand and ten. Or five point oh one kilojoules. Instead of dealing five thousand and ten joules, we can just put it in kilojoules, right? Divide by a thousand. Makes the sig figs work better, so we don't need to worry about scientific notation. 
what does that actually do to the temperature of the water? We dropped 15 grams of ice into a glass of water that's 150 grams that started at 60 Fahrenheit. What is the final temperature after all the ice melts? So when all 5.01 kilojoules have changed hands, what's the temperature of the water? Assuming that the water that started as ice cubes doesn't play any role in this. So let's say our 15 grams of ice was in a Ziploc bag or something like that and we pulled it out as soon as it was done melting. We can solve it the other way too. It just makes the math a little trickier. So assuming it's just 150 grams and started at, six, at 60 Fahrenheit. Well, now we have a temperature change. And anytime we have a temperature change, we're using this equation. Always for this class. Temperature change means use this equation. I said always, and then it made me uncomfortable. I think I can say that. I can't think of a case where we have a temperature change in this class where you're not going to just use this in some way. What's Q? Here's how much energy changed hands, right? And that's being absorbed by the ice. If it's being absorbed by the ice, is the water gaining or losing it? Sorry, if it's being absorbed, is the glass of water, the warm water, is the warm water gaining or losing? The, think about what, what happens when you put ice in water. The water cools down, right? The ice gets melted, the water cools down. Because these this 5.01 kilojoules absorbed by the ice had to come from somewhere, right? It came from the warm water. So the warm water lost that energy. It's really easy to tell if you were supposed to have a negative and you didn't give it a negative because when you solve this, you'll get that by putting water into, or putting ice into room temperature water, the water got warmer, um, which should be a red flag, right? Do your reasonableness check. Our mass of the warm water is 150 grams. Specific heat of water is always 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And delta T is what we're solving for, right? So, I can do this, 33.4 divided by four, you should get something like seven degrees Celsius-ish. 5,010 divided by 150 should give you 33.4 divided by four, should give you something between seven and eight. No, did I do that wrong? Yeah, I just can't do math. Between eight and nine. Who's plugged it in? Give me a number here. Um, oh, I forgot about the point one eight four. Seven point nine. So we see a temperature change of about eight degrees Celsius, which roughly speaking, that about double that to get our change in Fahrenheit. So we're talking about something like a 15 degree change in Fahrenheit going from 60 to 45. Does that seem like a reasonable amount? You put one big ice cube into one half of a coffee cup of warm water. I mean, I don't think most people are in the in the habit of you know getting out the thermometer to check after they do that, but it doesn't seem doesn't seem wrong. There's nothing about that that raises red flags, right? 
which at the very least tells us we probably plugged everything in right to our calculators. Um, to answer the last part of this, if we wanted to find the what is the temperature after all of the ice melts, this is our delta T. If we actually want to find the final temperature, we need our initial temperature in Celsius. So we could do, but we can do that conversion, right? All right. So we'll end here for today. And we'll come back talking about phase change and more. And uh, we have a calorimetry lab this week on Thursday. We'll actually do this process. We're not going to learn anything this time, maybe next time. And everybody be ready that still needs to take that midterm. Remember, you're taking it tomorrow. Be ready for it.